Hi, I'm Dan Hauser. I've been doing security full-time for about 21 years, mostly in strategy and architecture. I'm gonna to talk to you today about multi-factor authentication, how it can be hacked and bypassed, and how we need to change to armor up. Well, first of all, why do we even have multi-factor authentication? Well, we all know why, it's because passwords are completely terrible. We've seen very broad adoption by industry, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, the list goes on. And industry has adopted MFA across wide sectors, it's perhaps mandated by banking regulators, by fiat. And I don't know if we're exactly there yet, but it seems that we're very close to legally that MFA is a reasonable standard of due care. But does it work when we take a multi-factor authentication solution intended for a very specific use case and apply it elsewhere? Because multi-factored auth works great for a specific use case, like banking via an ATM, chip and pin purchase, e-commerce, voting. All of these are multi-factored authentication solutions that work very well. But we're challenged when we take a point solution designed to solve a very specific problem and extend it to a broad use case in an enterprise with many integration points and many entry points. So is it working in that context? Well, sort of a Dr. Evil working kind of way. There are lots of challenges. Now, I like MFA, MFA is great. And I'm saying, not saying MFA is bad, but there are some challenges that we need to go into with our eyes wide open and really understand what we're getting and not just gloss MFA over the solution and say, my job here is done. We won't cover all of these, but let's dive into a few and, and let's talk about perhaps first the presumption of path. And, and with this, I wanna talk about a, a little bit of a parable and the lock icon. Now, before you fanboys of Harry Potter get too excited, to my knowledge, there is not a wizard's bank. You cannot actually convert your galleons into muggles currency. But the visitor to a website, perhaps a banking website, would be encouraged they know who they're talking to because of the lock icon. And they can see the HTTPS if they're a little tech savvy. They can see that it seems to be the right domain name if they've been taught against phishing. And they have that confidence the lock icon is there is great and it's doing what we need it to do. But realistically, the lock icon doesn't work. I mean, it's there to indicate authentication to the user, that they're talking to who they think they are. And from an engineering perspective, it's, it's perfect auth. I mean, the technical bits work, but it completely fails the grandma test. And that's why people get fished. In, in fact, uh, Paul Kotcher, who was on the team that helped launch um, SSLv3 at, at Netscape back in the day, he talked about how the lock icon is, is hardly of much significance based on all the rest of the factors that are in the system. Um, so does it keep the conversation between Alice and Bob safe? Maybe. Does it tell you that Alice knows who Bob is? Not really. And why? Why is that? Well, continuing the parable, I, I do have a hobby and I those are some of my treasures there that I ride around on. I, I do enjoy motorcycling. And I, because of this hobby, I was pursuing a motorcycle cover because, you know, four bikes, a lot of bikes needed a cover. And I went out to, uh, to Amazon and looked and I found a motorcycle cover and I saw the lock and, and I had to laugh a little bit it, because the description was like, fantastic lock. And, okay, security folks, look at this. There are three dials, maximum of a thousand combinations on average guessable within 500. It looks like a cheapy lock. There are probably weaknesses. You could dial it in and, and, and get some, some, some take up on the, uh, on the combination and, and probably way fewer than 500 guesses you busted this. Uh, but I know you were, you were thinking, wait a minute, a TSA code lock? Oh, then now that's a joke because the TSA locks have a problem, a key problem. And that's because several years back, the Washington Post and, and other sources showed the keys. And they were kind enough to cover the numbers as though the numbers mattered, that you knew which was number seven and showed the bidding. <laughs> it wasn't long until there were 3D printable projects available and anybody can have a master key. So the fact that you have this weak lock that takes TSA keys that are widely known and available, well, that makes it a really weak lock. But let's not forget, we're locking a tent. And Amazon sells master keys for tents as well. As anybody with a Jeep can tell you, 
you don't really need a lock for a tent because a knife will get you in. But, but wait a minute, we don't actually have a tent, do we? We have a motorcycle cover and motorcycle covers don't have floors. So they only weigh, in this case, 20 kilos. Look, the attack vector is lift and throw. No knife required. Don't have to go in and punch the zipper with a pen or anything like that. Dial the combination, got your TSA key locks. It's lift and throw. And, and this is the problem with an engineering approach to a human system, to a complex system. We tend to focus on the lock. How many bits are there in the lock? How many pins and tumblers? What kind of security does it provide? And we really need to look at the system view, looking at all the paths in, all the weaknesses. Are we putting a lock on a tent when it's just lift and throw? So this is the problem with presumption of path because of an engineering approach. In many cases, we may have locked the front door with a hardened MFA represented by the, the guards, guns, walls, locks, great. But if the back door is propped open by the smokers, then you haven't gained much security by having the guys with the Uzis out front you really need to understand the entire system. So it's not just armoring the happy path, you have to armor all the paths because bad guys don't read your use cases, bad guys don't follow the rules and, and they don't care whether or not you, you've allocated budgeting for it, right? They really are looking at all the different vectors in, trying to find the easy paths and the unprotected paths. And in an enterprise, like is not, you have a lot of paths. I mean, think about it for a minute. Voicemail, email, network login, Wi-Fi, guest Wi-Fi, the security guard who's friendly at the front door, uh, the even more friendly help desk that wants to be helpful, badge readers, pin pads, the list goes on. Lots of different vectors, lots of different credentials, lots of different strengths, and probably very few of them are actually using multi-factored auth. So you need to do a walkabout from a virtual perspective. Walk around the organization and see, do you have a thin facade? Or have you accounted for all the vectors in? And, and not all paths are electronic. You have to look at the human paths as well too. We also have to identify that there are broken factors at play. Now, I'm not saying that all of these are bad. What I'm saying is that you can't say that I have this factor, it's good, it's secure, we're fine. You have to really understand that if you have some broke or weakened factors, you have to treat them as broke or weakened and understand how they apply to your specific use case and the abuse cases, because we know that passwords are horrible. It, it's, it's why we have MFA. We know that pins are bad. They're even worse than passwords because you know they're are less complex. Um, SMS is, has been compromised and is decertified as a, a factor by NIST. It's subject to caller ID as are phone calls, readily spoofed. Email is notoriously easy to bypass, and it's the top risk vector for phishing. So do we really want email as a vector for a trusted credential path when it's so easily compromised? Uh, static tokens, um, you know, several VPN solutions have relied on static tokens and, and those get handed around because you want to get that contractor in and before you know it, you're handing out tokens left and right and taking away a factor. Corporate email, it has some real problems if you have webmail because if you permit email auth, as one of your factors for multi-factor authentication solution, and you're asking for user ID and password once, and you're asking for it for webmail, you don't have multi-factor auth. You have same factor twice auth, and that's not MFA. And then of course, secret questions and answers, they've been decertified by NIST as a factor, and, and they're pretty horrible. Um, revealed by social engineering, um, they were revealed by your HR department when they wish somebody happy birthday or happy service anniversary. Uh, yeah, the questions and answers are, are are pretty terrible, and usually my brother can answer all of mine. So um, that's that's a known bad one. So you need to look at all your factors for the different MFA solutions you have with your eyes wide open. What are you actually employing, and what are the weakest possible situations in which those are deployed? You need to understand that. So let's talk about the human factor, uh, because something you have is a phone. So if I can break the human factor, I can violate the notion that we have a factor in something you have. So let's talk about a, a low-tech hacking attack. I try to point out the low-tech hacks, and this certainly is one. 
So this is a, um, an attack against the Azure MFA. Now, I like Microsoft. Um, Microsoft has done a tremendous job over the last 16 years with a security journey. I'm not picking on, on Azure, um, but this is a, a auth system that they and, and many others employ. And you'll recognize this audio clip, certainly, when I, when I play it. the Microsoft Simon verification system. Please press the pound key to finish your verification. You press pound. Your Simon was successfully verified. Goodbye. Okay, and we're all pretty well familiar with that model. You have really two things happening here. You have a phone call to a known enrolled phone that you're saying is an indication of something you have, and there's a human being able to hit pound on the other end. Okay, so first step one, we gather the password of the target, and we know that can be done because passwords are horrible, right? Phishing, all the rest. So you gather the password of your target. Uh, then you create a super annoying audio clip. I have no talent in this regard. I limited myself to what I could do with a bone stock MacBook Pro, Creative Commons and freely available um, unlicensed audio files, a hacker would not tie their arm behind their back like this. And I gave myself no more than half an hour. And I created a super annoying audio clip. Let us hear the super annoying audio clip. Using the Microsoft. Yes, Microsoft is sending you on vacation. Congratulations, big winner. All you have to do is press pound to approve Super this annoying. transaction and we'll get your vacation really annoying. right away. Yes, seven days in the sun and surf of Aruba. Please press the pound key to finish your verification. Okay, and so the super annoying audio clip, you then use a, a spoofing war dialer. You fake out the caller ID of the actual auth system, which is usually pretty easy to get. And then you launch a repeated dialing attack at 3 a.m., like every five to seven minutes. And you just wait until your target waits one second or two seconds to hit pound, pound, oh my gosh, please quit calling me. And then when they are starting to hit pound instantly, you then sign on with the spoof credential you gathered in, in, uh, in step one, the compromised credential, and the real auth system calls your target. They immediately hit pound and you're in and you've bypassed the something you have by breaking the human factor. And I have some friends who do pen testing and this doesn't always work, but it does work. Will they tell anybody the next day? Don't know, but judgment is really bad at 4 a.m. when you play super annoying audio clips. Let's talk about another attack on the human factor and that smishing, I didn't come up with a term, but somebody thought, hey, SMS and phishing combined, it's smishing. And, and so let's do a caller ID spoof. Well, first of all, you need to find out the number to the Big Bank Fraud Center. Pretty easy, you open an account with Big Bank and you sign up for multi-factor auth and you sign up for fraud notifications and you just start doing transactions and seeing what shows up and you're very quickly able as the bad guy to gain all of the inbound phone numbers that are used by Big Bank Fraud Center. You then do a SMS using that and you tell somebody they have a huge transaction, $1,700. To approve it, say yes, otherwise say no. Of course, your target says, no, don't take my money. I didn't authorize that transaction. Then you come back with, well, of course, we're your bank and we love you. And as we told you, all you have to do is prove you are you and give us the pin on your big bank OTP application, which of course, if you're the bad guy, you would name by name and, and tell them, you know, how they can provide that. And they provide 617508 and you log in as them. And then the money actually does disappear and maybe even more than $1,700. You have completely bypassed the something you have through hacking the human, through a little bit of caller ID, because there's a weak factor, two weak factors really, right? The reliance on, on SMS and caller ID and then the factor of the human being um, recognizing uh, a smishing attack. And then another attack against the human factor in the something you have for the for the phones is, is of course just getting rid of the phone, taking out of the picture by, by copying it, stealing, et cetera. Uh, if you haven't heard the story of Brother Orange, you have to search for this. 
fire up your web browser and check out Brother Orange. Hilarious story about a guy who got his phone stolen and it showed up in the hands of Brother Orange um, weeks later. Funny story. Um, but phones get stolen all the time. They get lost. Um, you remember Celebgate where some certain celebrities chose very weak pins for the security of their voicemail accounts or their cloud hosted um, photographic archives and people were downloading images that's a mobile account takeover due to poor credentials the mobile carrier account takeover via attacking the human being at the carrier help desk or the phone store Just tell them a sob story use some social engineering with some pretexting and then you can enroll your phone as the old phone with your new sim your new ein and you become that person and now i become the celebrity i want to be probably not a celebrity because i don't look anything like beyonce but you get what i'm saying you can become your target and then of course compromise endpoints you convince people to click on things because people do like to click on things humans get fooled compromised endpoints and if you're relying on the security of those endpoints as your factor well then the human factor breaks that down Another thing to be considered uh, when um, choosing mobile phones as a, a credential for the something you have is uh, another gap with independence of off, and off mechanisms. Now, uh, mobile phones are great platforms for a whole variety of solutions for, for com commerce and payments, social media, and authentication, photos, et cetera. Uh, it's ubiquitous. Millennials are never more than, than two meters away from their phone. They're out dancing on the dance floor at 11 p.m. It's in their hand. It's stuffed in their shirt. They have their phone guaranteed. They're not leaving it back at the table or back home. It's with them. But it's a single platform that has low trust transactions and high trust transactions all in the same platform. So consider if you have a requirement for out-of-band authentication, um, for your multi-factor auth, have you achieved that mandate if you're using a mobile auth solution? If you have a transaction come in from a mobile browser, should you still use a mobile auth solution for your out of band? Because essentially those are going to the same device and you should ask yourself for your requirements, your system, the security model you're trying to achieve, can you still call that out of band? Not saying you can't, I'm saying it's something to consider. And finally, probably the weakest issue we have with multi-factor authentication is account establishment and reset. You see, the thing is to establish an account, to reset an account, you have to have a credential. It's, it's part of the gig. If you don't have a credential and you can't prove you are you to reset the other credentials. And a lot of MFA solutions break down to free webmail. At the end of the day, if you can answer the webmail, then I can do an account reset and I can, go, I can go out to the webmail and I can answer the email, you must be you. And we've seen that emails are readily compromised. And once an email is compromised, it's pretty easy for the bad guy to search for all the credential resets that have been received in that email. So you know all the relationships they have that offer email as the credential reset factor. It's a great hit list. Look, password reset is the weakest link of all mostly because we rely on single factor auth to reset a multi-factor auth credential and this is probably as we start to armor up we need to consider we have to armor up the identity proofing process and we need to really eliminate single factor credential reset if we are dealing with an mfa solution resetting an mfa credential should require require two factors and if we've lost a factor because we lost a phone or forgotten a pin or whatever the case may be, to reestablish that credential and get the new password pin, new phone listed, that should require two factors. And that's difficult. To get there, you really have to understand all the questions human beings answer or ask to, to establish um, authentication verbally, how identity is established, and you have to understand all channels and all methods. And, and you really have to understand the fallback steps. If it's a question and answer, and it's you know your, your favorite sports team, is the help desk allowed to say it's a football team? That's a defined hint. Is that allowed? You've taken a lot of things off the table at that point. Do you call the manager? Do you tell them to go visit the security desk at their facility? 
Um, what is the fallback solution if they're having trouble with the factors? And are they even allowed to do it for high trust credentials? Uh, one system that I've seen technology firms use, and I've seen broader adoption now, and I think it's just genius, is the video credential reset. As the pandemic and work from home has taught us, pretty well everybody has the ability to do video conferencing now. If they didn't have it a year ago, they have it now. Your help desk has it, they have it. It's really easy to fire up a WebEx, a Zoom, a FaceTime, whatever you need to do to be able to pull up the photo in the employee system to have the person requesting a credential reset fire up their video channel you can see their face does their face match ask for a government photo id does the information match against the system you have you could even ask them a knowledge question at this point what's their manager's name ask them a random question to avoid a radio video replay like what is 11 times 8 and they have to say 88 obviously the next time you don't ask them what is 22 times 4 Okay, but you now have in, in a single system, you've established life by live stream, by response to a question. You have something you have, a little questionable. I mean, can you tell really that the hologram and et cetera for government ID? Okay, that maybe is not quite as strong as we'd like it to be if it was offered in, in person, but you have the picture on the ID matching the person holding it, matching the one in your system. The information on the ID matches the information in your system. You can ask them a question. This is really good. The great news is you can do this today. You have everything you need to do this right now. The only thing you need to do is, is modify your scripts. And, and that should be good news. So I think this is a great way to armor up um, the, the identity proofing process. But it's really important as we do that, that we have to protect more credentials than just passwords. The example we provided earlier of the MFA that calls your phone. Well, then your mobile phone number is a credential. Your home address is a credential if I'm mailing a pin to you. Uh, the challenge response questions, oh, please kill these now. They've been decertified by NIST, but the questions and answers, um, the answers certainly are, are credentials um, as much as, as a password is. Home email address, if you get to send them an out of band email response to reset a credential, that certainly is a credential as well. So any changes to any of these should trigger more extensive security processing. You should treat these as security events and handle these the same way you would an OTP reset, a password reset, any changes to these should trigger the same kind of processing, but you have to know where they are. You have to have knowledge and inventory of all your credentials. Now we usually know, well, I know where my LDAP is and Active Directory and got that. I know where my OTP um, solution is, got it. Um, but do you really have knowledge of all the rest of them? Every place where the mobile phone is, um, do you have visibility to the badging system and the, and, and the system that holds the parking sticker? Because those are credentials. You recognize that, that a, a car is allowed to come in the front gate and be on your premises. And know where you are is increasingly a, a credential. Uh, and those are trusted credentials that you have, have authorized. It's a good idea to consider which are trusted credentials that, that come from your organization and which are federated credentials that don't. You have to rely on them, but you have no idea when somebody's license plate number changes, when their email or their home address changes. Those are federated. So you know what they are at one point. Um, do you have the processes necessary to change those in the future and to reestablish trust in those? So there needs to be a validation process. And I would state there should be levels of trust in those, that there's probably a much different sort of trust level you would associate with perhaps a photo ID badge with, with an integrated uh, prox um, compared with a parking sticker or a license plate. Uh, you should have sufficiency of credentials, and this is where you should consider step up off and which of these are low security credentials and which are high security credentials. And what does it take to provide for identity proofing for a high security credential? It, it should require more off, right? You also need to understand the repositories, where they're stored, and dare I say, secure those, understand when they're compromised. And you have to understand the reset and establish processes. You'll find, I, I believe, when you start to peel the onion all, all of these, that some of the questions that are asked in one context by human beings are answered in other contexts. 
So having visibility to how that's happening across different frameworks is, is, is pretty important. And can you detect broad spectrum password probes? Of, of course, bad guys, um, stupid bad guys try 10,000 passwords against credentials. Smart ones, they go for summer 2021 against all your emails or against multiple interfaces. They might try against your Wi-Fi or, or your guest Wi-Fi. Um, they might go against uh, your desktop, against your, your uh, voice response unit or voicemail, as well as going through the web. So excessive failure attempts against any of these interfaces need to be correlated. And you should understand when a credential is being attacked in one context, your radar needs to go up for when you see activity in that in another context. You need to do correlation in your SIM against all the different repositories when you see excessive retry failures. Another concept I'd like to talk about is credential firewall. Now, I'm not selling you anything. I'm a practitioner. So don't think that I'm going to say, so buy my credential firewall thing. I'm not. We've heard a lot about zero trust. We've heard a lot about network segmentation over the years. And a lot of us have segmented our networks into perhaps an untrusted zone, a DMZ that has a higher level of trust because you've gone through a firewall, you've gone through um, an authentication system. So now you have um, you know, canonical traffic against a known protocol and it's trustworthy, et cetera. A lot of things you can say about it as it passes through these systems and climbs up the trust ladder. Uh, you have perhaps a segmented zone for workstations. Now notice that that's pink because people click on stuff in that zone. They open emails in that zone and those people get fished. So not quite as trustworthy as the rest, but not as bad as the hotel kiosk. And, and then many times a management zone so that a, a worker um, who needs to administer a box on your server zone would be able to come through a jump host in the management zone into the server zone. And, this, and the management zone may be where your backup solution, your patch management solution, inventory, where your syslog, uh, centralized log aggregation point is, all those management components can rely there with a nice jump host. And you have a model that allows you to segment off your server zone. Well, the real problem here is, what are you using to get into the organization in the first place from this untrusted zone? If you're asking for user ID and password, this should be a really familiar model to us. Because if you're typing your password for your network login, in an untrusted zone, you're leaking keys. And is that in an untrusted box, untrusted network? Is it that hotel kiosk? Is, is it a jailbroken phone running malware? What are you revealing about your credentials? And that's why I think we need to really think about a credential firewall that matches our network firewall model. We need to segment into minimally trusted credentials that allow you to get in and no more. Those that allow you to operate within that zone your driver's license inside it that gives you your desktop access, it gives you your email, it gives you a login to um, the single sign-on system that's used for HR applications, et cetera, internally. Uh, but then when I go to the management zone, perhaps I need different credentials, particularly for the crown jewels. And this is where I think the credential firewall is important. That the credential firewall should look at perhaps a different set of credentials that the credentials you use to get into the management zone in your trusted ops area should probably be different than your crown jewels. And the example I like to provide for my guys when I talk about this is you have to think about it like a different company. I usually name Coke. I don't work for Coke, but I do love Diet Coke. And so I tell them, just think of that as being Coke. It's a different company. Staples, Apple, pick whoever you like, but it's not you. And so there should be no implicit trust between that zone and the other zones. Now, this is hard because this means that the credentials your backup solution uses have to be different. And your patch management and your antivirus and all the rest, um, they need to be different. But that's how a lot of companies get compromised is that bad guys punk these credentials and use them to go everywhere. So you need to consider how are you gonna get different credentials out here for your crown jewels? And that's where I think a, um, uh, a credential firewall is useful. And a final way we need to armor up, I think, is you have to look at your existing MFA as legacy. And I know this is painful because you probably spent a million dollars and 12 or 18 months rolling it out and it took a lot of justification and it was expensive and everything else. But MFA solutions fail catastrophically because crypto fails catastrophically and most of them are based on cryptography. There might be some slow erosion 
But when we saw with, with Poodle, Meltdown, Spectre, um, those trusted systems um, happen very, very quickly. Some of those chip-based, some of those cryptography-based. And now your MFA solutions punked and owned and no longer trustworthy. What's your plan now? Well, you can fail shut and allow single factor off. That's not really a continuity plan for multi-factor. Or you can fail open and just block access to the system, which is not a career plan. But if your MFA solution goes down, what do you do? And if it's not a matter of just restarting it because it's no longer trustworthy, what do you do? You, you have to have two independent MFA solutions, not independent of same, because if that system's no longer trustworthy, both are broken. So you have to have one in the wings. I know this is hard, but you have to look at your existing MFA as legacy. So what can we take with us? Well, next week, think about identifying your critical credentials in the repositories and create a plan for getting those mapped and controlled and figure out over the next three months where those are. Find them, find the paths, find the flows for credential established, identity proofing, and for credential reset. And then try to normalize as best possible the identity verification standards and scripts so one system's not giving away credentials to the other system, that they both have, have equitable and consistent means of establishing identity. And then within six months, you need to consider about getting velocity checks across all those places you've found, getting those into your SIM. You need to create a backup MFA plan or solution for what's going to happen when the existing one dies. And then you have to take your insecure credentials and migrate them. Um, please consider using NIST 863-3 as a credential standard. It's awesome. And I've already gotten a few questions. I'm sure there are more. So surely there are a few questions you can throw at me. And thank you.